Okay, everybody. I think we'll we'll go ahead and get started, and just keep on eating. This is a this is a luncheon seminar, and some of you just got in here and got your lunch, and it's okay to eat during these seminars. So we're glad to have you here. I'm Mark Sheffield, and I'm a partner here at Abbott Stringham and Lynch. We're a CPA firm, and I'm in charge of our emerging business group, which we define as startup and ramp up companies. We've been doing these seminars for about five years and we bring in subject matter experts to talk about different things and some of you have spoken at, at uh, this event so we're glad to have you here. Uh, this is actually going to be the last emerging business group luncheon seminar that we're teaching for the year and the reason is that we're moving. And so we're packing up. There's a lot going on in the next month. I think it's the second week of November um, when we're actually going to be moving to Meridian Avenue, just about a block or two away. So we're not far. We're going to go into a, a three-story building, and we're going to take two, two floors. So the reason is we ran out of space here, and, which is a good thing, right? So we're real excited about our, our new space and, and where we're going to be. So our topic today uh, is about learning, and you know, when I was preparing for this, I thought, "What am I doing?" You know, this is a risky topic to talk about, and and it's risky because people learn in different ways. You know, we have people that auditory learners, visual learners, right, and then some are just book learners, and others are experiential, and and you've you figured out how you learn best, you know, or you figured out what works for you, right? And you're above average learners already, or you wouldn't be here because you're interested in a topic like this. So, but it's still risky because I don't have a doctor of education degree, okay? I'm a CPA, but I've been doing this in a few months for 40 years, just a few months short of 40 years. Can you believe it? I just, I, it just amazes me the time has gone by so fast. And, and I've always been interested in learning. Uh, and I just started deciding, you know, I should put some of this stuff together and maybe it would be of value to others. And so that's what I've done here. Um, this is just, I haven't stolen it from anybody. It's just kind of stuff that came off the top of my head I've got some quotes that I did steal from people, and I'll give you their names when you quote it. But um, it's just, it, you might not agree with it all, right? <laughs> because learning is such an individual thing. And that's okay. You know, that's perfectly okay. But I didn't want to hold back. You know, I wanted to tell you what I've learned, you know, so that it would be of value to you. And so I'm going to give you a challenge. A challenge for the next hour is that you become a diligent learner. Now, you're probably already diligent learners, many of you, but I mean, and we'll, you'll we'll understand better how I define a diligent learner, okay? But it's on, a, on an extra level above the typical learner, okay? So diligent learners do different things. And one of the things that they do is they focus on what they don't know, right? And so, what I'm asking you to focus on what you don't know during this hour. Now, you'll be tempted, because you're all learners, to share what you've learned about learning. But we're not going to have time. We don't want you to be in that teaching role for this hour, because it really ought to be a two-hour seminar, right? That would be fun and interesting to hear what everybody thinks, but we don't have time. So you, I would encourage you to be a learner for this next hour and listen and be open-minded and if you hear things you disagree with that's okay just put it off to the side but listen in your heart and in your mind and with every facility you have for something that you can pick up and take out of this okay and use it so that you can be a more diligent learner so one of the things that diligent learners do, I think, okay, again, these are my opinions that I'm going to share with you, is they take notes. Okay? Now, I knew a guy who, could take, who took notes mentally. He had, a, 
you know, Watson computer for his brain. It was absolutely incredible. He had recall from 30 years ago. And he never took a note in his life, but he had absolute recall. I mean, he was just an amazing guy, you know. But I, that's not me. And, and it might not be you, but if it's not you, then you take notes. Okay, and you can take them electronically, you can take them on paper. So you've got some paper that you can write on, but those are also some notes, and it's actually the slides that are available here. So you don't have to worry about getting copies of that. So you can write on the side of that if you want. But I've also got, Amanda has got some notepads. So anybody would like a notepad, raise your hand. Okay, so you can take notes, because if you get impressions, if you get ideas, you need to put that down so you don't forget, okay? All right, now, the other thing is that as, as you're listening, it's okay to ask questions, okay? Diligent learners ask questions, so that's okay because sometimes I'm not real clear, <laughs> okay? I can say things that I didn't even realize that I said. You know, I gave, I gave a talk a couple of months ago on 300 people, and afterwards my wife said, well, you said this. I said, I did? <laughs> she says, that's what you said. And it was like totally wrong. And I was like so embarrassed, you know, that I had said that and I didn't even realize it. So if while I'm talking, I say something that doesn't make sense, or you're like, oh, that's just, you know, Mark, what do you mean by that? You know, we don't get it. You did not, you know, connect the dots here. What do you mean? Okay, that's okay, because you're learners, and you need to understand, you know, what I'm talking about. So that's okay to ask those questions. Okay, any questions about the challenge that I'm giving you? All right, let's start out. There are three current key learning tools, okay, that are available for learners. Okay, and here's what they are. And, and you, you got them, everyone in this room received these when you were born. Okay. And one of them, the first one, is a capacity. Okay. You received the capacity to learn. Wonderful tool, right? Okay. The second thing is you received is curiosity. Curiosity. I don't even think I spelled it right, but anyway, okay, and, and then the third thing that you receive is light, okay, so light, I'm not talking about this physical light that's in this room, okay, I'm talking about spiritual light, okay, and it's manifest in different ways, you know, it can come from feelings, you know, it can come from impressions. It can come from your conscience. Okay? There's a whole bunch of different ways. And you know what I'm talking about. It's kind of like this not intellectual type of learning. Right? It's, a, it's like a spiritual learning. Okay? And that's light. We'll just call it that. Okay? Um, so, an, an example. You've all experienced it before because you're all born with it. Right? We all have it. So, an example would be Let's say that on a sudden moment, you unexpectedly get this brilliant idea. Okay? You've had that happen. You go, whoa! Ta-da! And it's accompanied by this powerful joy. You say, yes! Oh, yeah! Okay? And so what do we call that? I mean, there's terms for it. It's like the Eureka effect. That's one of them. Or the aha moment. You've heard those? Okay. And, and it often happens when maybe you've been struggling with this incomprehensible problem. Right? And you can't figure it out. And then suddenly, the answer just falls in your lap. And you just go, whoa! You know, where did that come from? And you... You're so excited that you got the idea that you just, you know, often don't worry about it after that. Just say, well, that was cool, you know. <laughs> but, you know, some might say, well, where did that come from? You know, and whether you, you realize it or not, 
you know, I would submit that you have just been the recipient of this. Okay, you have just been the recipient of some inspiration, let's call it that, okay, that you got in that moment. And that's a valuable thing. You know, that's a, that's a source of knowledge, isn't it? Okay, that, that's really worthwhile. Now, children have an abundance of this. You know, they're born with it. They're so pure and they're so innocent and they just say profound things. You're all nodding your head, right? And you're going, whoa, where did that come from? Right? Because they have, they have an abundance of this, right? And, and they keep that <laughs> for, for time. They have curiosity. They're asking questions all the time, right? right? And they're learning like crazy. They're like on this trajectory. You know, and then they start to become teenagers. <laughs> okay? And they're feeling a little peer pressure. And suddenly, in classroom settings, they're not asking as many questions. You know, I taught seminary to high school kids for four years at 6 a.m. in the morning, four years in a row. This is about 15 years ago. It was a huge effort because I had to prepare a lesson every single night of the week. But I noticed that it was like the Pareto Principle. There were about 20% of the students who were asking 80% of the questions. You know, some of them were just too shy. You know, but that's kind of the way it was. And in college, you know, that's what happens. You get, you know, very few students are willing to take the risk of raising their hand and asking a question. And then as we become adults, we ask fewer questions and fewer questions. Why is that? Is it because we stopped learning? I don't know. The peer pressure? Well, I don't know exactly what it is. But is it we, we lost our curiosity a little bit? I don't think so. Now, it could be we lose our capacity a little bit <laughs> as we get older. That could be a, a valid reason. Okay? Or it could be that we, haven't, we don't have as much of this as we used to have you know, as a child. Okay. So, here's life's learning test. Okay. Here's this, here's this chart, and you got important knowledge up here, and here's our birth, and here's time. Okay. And so, what we, we start out, you know, the first eight years or so, we're growing, and we're just like this high trajectory of learning, diligent learners doing great. Okay. And if we can keep it going, keep the curiosity, and keep the effort going, and keep asking questions, okay, then we, just, we, can just, we can continue on that curve, and we can be a diligent learner. Now, I haven't always been a diligent learner, okay? There's been times in my life where I've coasted a little bit. And I get a gentle reminder from my wife, honey, you're spending a little time on sports. I know you, I'm rattling too many sports uh, <laughs> trivia information. I know this and this and this and this. It's like, who cares, right? That's not important knowledge, but it's sure fun. But so I have to kick myself every once in a while and say, okay, wait a minute, you're, you're tapering off a little bit here on your learning curve, right? And so what typical learners do is they're like, they're like this. Oh, they're doing great, you know, up until about 8 or 12, and then they become teenagers, and then they, they start to lose the interest in learning, you know, and then as they become further in adults, and so then it, you know, this is often what happens, is you have a typical learner. Okay? And that's what we don't want to have happen. We want to stay on that trajectory. Okay, any questions on this? All right, let's go to the next thing. Diligent learners concentrate on what they don't know. Okay, so in the home that I grew up in, we were encouraged, I had four brothers and two sisters, and my parents encouraged us 
to ask questions. So we did. And they, they not only encouraged us, they expected us to ask questions. So our dinner table at night was always an interesting discussion. That's just the way we, it was. And everybody wanted to be there because you were going to learn something. And the TV had restrictions of how much time you could watch TV. And when we went to school, you were expected to bring home A's. B's were unacceptable. And, and I look back on it and I think, wow, what, did that, what happened? You know, How did my parents figure this out? I don't even remember my parents helping me that much with school, which is shocking. I'm sure they did. I think my mother helped me with English and history stuff, but, but neither my mother or my father knew math or science or anything like that. My father was a special agent for the FBI for 38 years. So he was gone a lot of the time, you know. But um, it was interesting because two of my brothers ended up being surgeons. Another brother was a CFO of a comp two or three companies, and he retired at age 45. But he's, st he's still on the diligent learner curve, even though he's retired. He's just doing nonprofit stuff up the yin yang. You know? Another brother is an accomplished attorney. And, and then my sisters are also accomplished, college graduates, wonderful. And my sister's husband uh, is also a doctor. And whenever we get around uh, family events, my sister's husband will pull me aside and start asking me questions. <laughs> you know, for 15 minutes, he just peppers me with questions, you know. <laughs> and so, you know, it makes me feel good because he's asking me questions. I say, oh, okay. <laughs> He knows how smart I am. He wants to learn from me. You know? <laughs> but, and I thought, well, you know, he's just, he's just a radiologist. He's just a regular doctor, you know. I, he had a big, nice home and stuff, right? Had six kids and a big, beautiful home. And so I knew he was a successful doctor. But for years and years, this went on. And then I found out, because they never told me, my sister never told me, he never told me, that he was this renowned radiologist known across the country and he speaks at conventions and stuff and everybody looks to him because he's so smart and then I think aha he asks questions that's what he does he asks questions he learns everywhere he goes even at family events <laughs> right so it, it was just amazing so with uh, our children we tried to do the same thing you know, all of my kids, I have five children, and my wife gets the credit because she taught them not only English, but the math and the science and all that. And, and two of my kids have doctorates. One is a doctor of pharmacology. One is a doctor of bioinformatics, and he's a professor. And the other one of my kids is a uh, computer scientist, and he has a master's degree in electrical engineering. And then my other two daughters are both scientists in the sense that they've graduated in biology, biological sciences, right? And it's just like, wow, you know, how did that work? And I thought, well, we encouraged them to ask questions. We turned the TV off. They had computers when they first came out. We wanted them to use them, but we restricted their use. When Game Boys came out, you can use the Game Boy, but only when we're traveling on a long-term trip. You can't use it at home, okay? Because we wanted them to focus on the most important things, right? So that's the way it was with, with our kids. Um, when I would go to places with my dad, like we would go to meetings, okay? And he always had a pack of notes in his four by six okay? <laughs> cards. And he would have a pencil and he would take notes. And so I got, I got into a habit of doing that, of taking notes everywhere I went. And it, it, is, it is, comes to me, it's like when I sit down and I come to a thing like this and I have my pad or my cards or whatever and I have my pencil, it's like it's a signal to my soul that here is a person that's ready to learn. I've got the pencil there, now go ahead, fire away. 
because I'm taking notes. I'm going to capture what there is in this moment to learn, right? And so I have a filing cabinet at home of all these four by six note cards by topic, you know? And yeah, I've referred to them from time to time, but you know, the, the biggest benefit was I was making the notes. And then when I filed it, I reviewed that note. And I kept track of, you know, I would be able to go back and retrieve it, right? So those were the things that were uh, helpful. Now, open to conviction. Okay, this is the most important character trait for a diligent learner, in my opinion. It's absolutely essential, okay? It's the number one trait. You have to be, have this meekness, this humility that you can rec recognize you don't know it all, right? Have you ever talked to somebody who thinks they're always right? You, you're nodding. Yeah. It's like you just don't even want to talk to them because you can't convince them of anything, right? It, it doesn't matter because they're not interested. They're not a diligent learner. And the dead giveaway that they're not a diligent learner is when they say, I'm always right. Right? When that happens, it's like, okay. All right. You're always right. Okay. Don't even want to talk to you. Right? So when we do our evaluations here at our firm, we ask our staff to do a self-evaluation. And when they do their evaluations, and if it comes back with all these areas that are checked outstanding, 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 okay, the partners here get nervous. Okay? Why? Because they don't recognize that they've got some weaknesses and some things to learn and improve on. Okay? They think that they're on this track, or even on this track, right? And they're not. And because they don't have enough humility, to s then they're prevented from learning. Okay, we have a term for it. It's called, they're too smart for their britches, right? <laughs> and, and there was someone said, it's not what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you know that isn't so. Okay. So can you understand that? Okay. It's what you know that isn't so. In other words, you think you know everything, and you don't. And so when our staff, and we talk to them and we say, um, we think you've got these areas where you can improve in. And if they get defensive, then we go, whoa. We thought we hired a diligent learner here. Maybe we didn't. You know, I tell our staff when we hire them, our new staff, I say, we didn't hire you because of the learning that you brought from college. Because frankly, we're not going to make any money for you for about, from you for about a year anyway. Because you don't know what we need you to know. We hired you because we think that you're a diligent learner. That's why we hired you. And they're shocked. They go, oh, oh. So we want you to continue to learn. And if you think that you're going to get all the learning you need just from the continuing education that we provide, you're wrong. That's insufficient. Okay. The managing partner of this firm for years, the founder, one of the founders, Morgan Lynch, used to come in from the time he started at Pete Marwick out of college. He would come to work at 7 a.m. every morning. And he would read the tax code okay, until 8.30. So he was one of those what you call book learners, right? And I could never do that. I couldn't do it. I couldn't stay awake. I would fall on my head on the desk, you know, during that. So I didn't try to do that. But what I ended up doing from the time I started was at 5.30, I would turn off my client clock of charging time to a client. And I'd say, okay, this is learning time. 
and I would go over the things that I had worked on that day and say, what did I learn from this? And I would make charts and graphs and flow charts. And I would make notes that I could file into my retrieval system to learn what I had so that I could really understand. So I was there an extra hour longer. And I'm talking outside of taxis, you know, from 5.30 to 6.30. That was my learning time. And it was very productive for me because it was so important. And I knew that if I was going to get ahead, I had to put the learning time in on the things that are most important. Okay. So that's open to conviction. Next item. Diligent learners can separate important knowledge from trivial knowledge. All right, so you would think with the internet and this explosion of knowledge that we would have people that are smarter and smarter, wouldn't you? Because there's all this knowledge bill. And so I would submit to you, and I could be wrong, that they are smarter and smarter in some things. Texting, okay. <laughs> social media, computers, internet, all of that stuff, they're very smart, way smarter than I am. But I don't know how well that they can separate that important knowledge from this bombardment of internet trivia that is tantalizing them. And it's where they spend a lot of time. That's concerning. Diligent learners can separate it. And they're very careful about where they direct their efforts so that they do it in the places where there's the most worth. This is a chart that I did. And I'm not an artist. <laughs> okay? mm -hmm. And some of you can do better and make your own chart, I'm sure. Okay? So don't worry too much about what I put into what box or whatever. I'm just, this is how I see it is all, okay? So the most valuable type of knowledge is in the bullseye there, the wisdom stuff, okay? And so I call that the spiritual truths or one's purpose. I mean, that's so basic. What are you here for? What are you trying to accomplish in your life? You know, what is your mission? You know, if you don't know that, that's some knowledge that you need to get, right? Because that's really important, right? Um, what, what brings you the most happiness? What are, wh all these things are, are, are things that are felt. These are things that come from this. Okay? That's the teacher of these things. Have you ever had someone, a loved one, tell you that you don't, that you don't love them? Okay? Maybe a child, you know, a son or a daughter said, you don't love me, mom or dad. You know. Could be an elderly parent you know, who has dementia or something. You know. Hopefully it's not a spouse. <laughs> <laughs> but, but when you hear that, you're just like incredulous. You're like, what? I don't love you? How can you say that? You know, you, you, that's my knowledge, right? I have that knowledge in my heart. And you're denying me that knowledge? I mean, that's kind of what you're thinking. How can that be? Right? And, but they're thinking, wait a minute, you know, I don't have scientific evidence <laughs> that you do. And I know that you don't, so I'm going to push your buttons a little bit and say that you don't love me. Because they know that you can't prove it. Right? You can prove it to yourself. Okay? That's, the, that's kind of the way the wisdom knowledge is. You know, it's, a, it's an inner feeling type of thing. And, and so that's, that's valuable learning and that's valuable help. 
Okay, there's a list that you have. So you can go to the next page. The, the first page is the list of these slides. The next page is a, well, let's see, is the, is the chart there first? Okay, the chart. Okay, then there's a list. Okay, so this list is um, a list of, what does it say on it? Spiritual aspects of learning. Okay, so this is, I'm not going to go through this, just all of this, but, but if you go down to number 13, acknowledge we have to all have to earn our keep. Okay, so by the sweat of the brow, all the days of our life, right? We have to earn a living. That's what we're told. So that's good. Recognize that. You know, I think that's why a lot of you are here, and that's kind of the premise of this whole talk, is how do you, how do you keep learning so that you can be successful in business? So that you can provide for yourself and your family. That's really, really important knowledge, how to provide your family, right? It's absolutely important. Here, important business occupational knowledge. Very, very important. Okay. So look at number 14. How can light help you with this very, very important knowledge? How can it help you? Three things. One, it gives you unexpected ideas, solutions to business problems. It can help you recall important information and heighten your capacity. Number two, it gives you peace, joy, comfort, purpose, and confidence. If you have those kinds of feelings, don't you think that you're going to be a more diligent learner? Of course you are. Because everything just feels right. right. You're going to be better in your business if you do that. Number three, it acts as your conscience, warning you when you are wrong. So I can't tell you getting emotional when I talk about this. But I've been doing this for 40 years. And I've worked on a lot of client problems. And they become my problem when a client is paying me to help them with their problems. And sometimes I will sit for hours and just try to figure this out. And it's just not being resolved. I can't get there. Okay, So then I stop for a moment, or several moments, maybe overnight, you know, shut it down for the day, and I do some things on this list. Okay, And then I come back, and at an unexpected time, boom, the aha moment comes. And it's happened to me hundreds of times. I can tell you that that's true. And I can't explain it other than in these terms. That's the only way I know how to explain it. Okay? It's powerful. And that can happen to you because you have that ability. You were born with the light. Everybody in this room has it. And you know what I'm talking about because you've had these moments. Say, the key is, how do you have more of them? You know, look back at all the times you've had these aha moments in your life. Think, okay, this can happen. It can happen. How can I get more of those? I need them. I want to be successful in my business. Okay? And so you can get them. There are some things that you can do to give you that. So I just offer that little bit of, of advice for you, okay? Um, okay, where are we? Um, oh yeah, okay. There is a, when, <coughs> last, last fall, uh, my wife and I uh, were visiting my son who's in Austria and we stopped in England and we went to Cambridge. And the University of Cambridge. Has anybody here been to Cambridge? A few people, okay. It's, it's the greatest place. I love it. I could live there for a couple of years. The, the, virtually the whole town is the University of Cambridge. But there's like 12 colleges that are, that are part of the overall Cambridge University system. 
there's King's College, there's, I can't remember all the other ones, but you've probably heard of some of them. And each college has their own quad, you know, with dorms surrounding it. You've seen the movies, Chariots of Fire and all that, right? So I also I think, I think that was Oxford, though. But, but anyway, so they, they have it. The, and in the center of this quad, in the center of the classrooms for each college is a house of meditation, like a chapel. Non-denominational, you know. But for centuries, the University of Cambridge has realized that there's this really, really important part of learning, okay, that can be overlooked. And they wanted their students who are doing studying intellectually to have a place to go to meditate and just ponder and think about things and pray if they wanted to. But all denominations. So it was so fun to go to each of the colleges and walk into the chapel and just feel the peace that was there. It was just, it was, it was like tangible. It was like, wow, this is powerful. These students get it. That for hundreds of years, the people who put that together get it. Okay? So have you ever, you know, Leland and Jane Stanford, they founded uh, Stanford University as a memorial to their son, Leland Jr., who died in his youth. And so they spent all this money and, and a campus dedicated. So Jane Lathrop Stanford, a great visionary, you know, she got this. She understood it. So she said, we will have a chapel, non-denominational, in the center of the campus. And if you go into that chapel and you look on the left side of the wall, there's an inscription that she wrote. And here's what it says. Knowledge is intelligence and its impress, which means mark or stamp. I had to look that up because I didn't know what it meant in that context. But knowledge is intelligence and its impress comes upon the mind. Wisdom is the desire of the heart. Wisdom is the highest spiritual intelligence, while the natural man, through knowledge, can know nothing of wisdom. Okay? Isn't that interesting? So, all right. Any questions on types of knowledge? Okay. So now we've got all this knowledge, we've got this internet, we've got all this stuff, and we've got to figure out where do I spend my time? What are the best resources? Okay, so you can go to the next chart. You have a copy of this. So this is one where there's going to be a lot of disagreement. <laughs> okay, so I really went out on the limb when I put what's best, what's better, what's good, what's gray, you could totally disagree, and that's fine. You know, the, the point is, have you thought about this? You know, have you considered where you want to be spending your time based on what your goals and objectives are? Because it's really easy to do what I sometimes do and just kind of coast into the sport mode, <laughs> right? And you realize, oh my, I've spent a lot of time watching sports, right? So there's some introspection that needs to happen. So you can say, well, okay, what's a reasonable amount of time to spend in sports? Or other avocations. You women out there, okay? What, what, how, how much time do you want to spend there? I remember one time in my youth, I was a teenager, and I would get the Sunday newspaper. It was that thick in those days, because we didn't have the internet. And I would try to be the first one to get the Sunday newspaper after we came home from church. And I would sit down, and I would start reading it. The comics, every comic. <laughs> you know. And it would take me two hours to get through the newspaper. 
And my mother said to me one day, she says, Mark, do you think it's a good idea to spend that much time reading the newspaper? And I thought, oh, I think you're right. That's not a good idea. In fact, there's a lot better ideas, you know? And so really it was that point that I started reading books like crazy. It was that, that little reminder kind of triggered it and said, I'm spending all this time in the newspaper and I could be reading really, really good books. And it's so much fun because if there, if there are these kinds of books, then you get that, right? And you get that more often. And it's like, wow, so exciting, right? But that's, that's how you learn, okay? You learn what the best stuff is and what the better stuff is. And you take your time to pencil it out and think about it and say, what is going to get you to where you want to be? All right. All right, this one. Diligent learners follow the three R's. Record what they learn in the moment so they can retrieve it later. We talked about this. It's pure gold. It's so exciting when you've summarized something you learned, you know, after a seminar. I've, I spend a lot of time in eight-hour seminars. And at the end of eight hour, every eight-hour seminar, I try to take my notes and put it down on two pages of the meat, the gold nuggets, right? And then I file those away. And then one day I think, I need this, I need this. And if you can go back and retrieve that, it's like, wow, this is so great. This is exactly what I need, right? But it's, it's there for you, you know, if you can do that. And, and we've and we got computers now that will help with that even more. My system is still archaic. I've got to get it onto the computers. But that's really helpful. What else they do is they repeat what they learn in that hour. So at the end of an eight-hour seminar, I go back and go over it and look at my notes and I say, okay, what did I learn? Okay, that's right. I learned that. Okay. And I try to get it in my mind, but I also put it down on paper, you know, file it, so I've got it. But if you can repeat, that's good. So today, you know, if it's okay if you ask questions, but it's also okay to repeat what you learned. You know, not what you brought with you, okay? Because you already learned that. But if any of you, in a few moments, would like to say what you learned, that's good, because that reinforces what you learned when you tell somebody else what you learned, right? That's an important thing that diligent learners do. You know, they go home and tell their spouse or their son or daughter what they learned. You know, and when your son or daughter comes home, you say, "What did you learn?" Right? I mean, that's what my mother did. And I would go, oh, you know, I learned this, and I learned that, and I learned this. And then I knew she was going to ask that question, so I was more careful to be prepared. Right? <laughs> what I learned. But that's what diligent learners do. They repeat. Okay? And then they rehearse, and they practice, and they apply what they've learned in the days or months following. They, that's just extra reinforcement, isn't it? So the idea is that we go through life and you learn line upon line, a little, a little here, a little there. You just keep learning more and more and more. And it's so fun. You know, it's the funnest thing ever. You know, when, when I was 19 years old, I was uh, called to Japan on a mission for two years. And I had to learn Japanese. And it was the hardest thing I've ever done, before or since. It doesn't matter. It's just hard. And I just beat my head against the wall, trying so hard. Because it wasn't as natural for me as some of the other missionaries. 
it was hard. And, but my mother had taught me how to work and how to learn. So I kept at it, and I kept at it. And so by the end of my mission, I was way, way, way above average as, as to the missionaries and their language speaking ability. But it was because I worked at it. But it was so much fun to do that, I didn't want to come home. It was just, I mean, not just the language, but the whole experience was a learning experience, right? And so, but they, they won't let you stay more than two years. So now you have, to, you, you have to go home and they want you to go to school and get married and raise a family, right? So that's what you do. So, but, but I didn't, but then you know what I didn't do? For 10 years, I did do, is I kept my Japanese up. You know, I, I was one class away from having a minor in Japanese. So I kept it up and I'd have, we'd have exchange students and I would, you know, keep it going. And then I started to lose it. And I eventually, you know, I'm not fluent in Japanese anymore. I mean, I think I could pick it up pretty quickly again, but I've lost my vocabulary. And uh, it just, I've regretted that. You know, I have been casual in keeping that learning going. And if I were doing it again, I would watch less sports <laughs> and spend more time keeping up what I had learned. Because it, it's, it, it was important. You know, I had spent a lot of time to do that, and I, I didn't keep it up. Okay, so num last issue. Any questions on this? Any questions at all? Okay, let's go to the, the next one. Whoops. Okay, diligent learners deliver the message to Garcia. Okay. Who here has read the message to Garcia? Anybody? All right. It's you've got a copy of it at the at the very end there. And turn to turn to this section right here, 1899, a message to Garcia. Okay? So this was a this was an article in a magazine that Albert Hubbard wrote in 1899. And it was in connection with the Spanish-American War. Okay? So he writes this article in an hour. He puts it out, and people went crazy over it. They wanted copies of it by the hundreds of thousands. It just went viral, if you can call it viral, in 1899. But it was like the most published article ever in history. And so the, the Japanese army wanted a copy of it. The Russian army wanted a copy of it. All these countries wanted copies of it, and it just went crazy. And it's still in print. You know, I just pulled this off. I, I think it's old enough that it's not a copyright anymore. Is there a copyright sign on there? I don't think so. So I printed it off for you so you have a copy. But Here's what he says. Let's just read the first couple of paragraphs. In all this Cuban business, there is one man stands out on the horizon of my memory like Mars at Perihelion. When war broke out between Spain and the United States, it was very necessary to communicate quickly with the leader of the insurgents. Garcia was somewhere in that mountain vastness of Cuba. No one knew where. No mail nor telegraph message could reach him. The President of the United States must secure his cooperation and quickly what to do. Someone said to the President, there's a fellow by the name of Rowan that will find Garcia for you if anybody can. Rowan was sent for and given a letter to be delivered to Garcia. How the fellow by the name of Rowan took the letter, sealed it up in an oilskin pouch, strapped it over his heart in four days, landed by night off the coast of Cuba from an open boat, disappeared into the jungle, and in three weeks came out on the other side of the island, having traversed a hostile country on foot, and delivered his letter to Garcia, are things I have no special desire now to tell in detail. There hasn't been a movie made, though, about it. <laughs> but that wasn't his point. He delivered the message. 
He says, the point I wish to make is this. McKinley gave Rowan a letter to be delivered to Garcia. Rowan took the letter and did not ask, where is he at? By eternal, there is a man whose form should be cast in deathless bronze and the statue placed in every college of the land. It is not book learning young men need, nor instruction about this and that, but a stiffening of the vertebrae which will cause them to be loyal to a trust, to act promptly, concentrate their energies, do the thing, carry the message to Garcia. So when we have new hires, and if I can corner them in my office, <laughs> I tell them this story about Garcia, and I tell them that I will absolutely guarantee that they will have a job for the rest of their life, either with our firm or anywhere else if they want to go somewhere else, if they can do what they're asked to do. If they can deliver the message to Garcia. If they can pull that off, they'll be successful. Because, and you'll have to read this when you get home. It's so fun to read. Because that's not typical. You know, a lot of employees forget what they were supposed to do. Or they just don't get around to doing it. And so it doesn't happen. And if it does, it's not in a timely fashion, right? So here's something I wrote. Maybe someday this will be quoted by somebody. I don't know. <laughs> and, and the only reason I'm reading it is because we're running out of time, and I think it's pretty clear. Real learners understand, diligent learners understand, that learning is useless unless they execute. Executing is putting knowledge into action. So action is really the capstone or the pinnacle of learning. The curse of the typical learner is they don't execute well. Tragically, they postpone or forget again and again, displaying their lack of focus on the very job they were hired for. The secret to never be out of work is the ability to execute, deliver the message to Garcia. Okay, so in conclusion, it's not about the money. I'm convinced. Sometimes we think that it's about the money because that's the means by which we survive, right? But I've learned over the last 40 years that if our focus is on this, being a diligent learner, okay, and if we do the things that help us be a diligent learner, then the money just comes. But if we focus on the money, then we kind of lose our bearings a little bit about what's the most important knowledge. And not having that important knowledge and wisdom impacts our ability to learn and our ability to execute. Because when we've got all of the cylinders running with our body that we've taken care of and our spirit that we've taken care of, then we put ourselves in the best position to learn and to execute. Anyway, that's what I've learned. Any questions? Feel free, please. Yes. 
Thank you for your uh, presentation. It gave a lot of insight into my life. <laughs> um, and I kind of share a lot in common with you, but your path and my path have not been the same. Um, when someone has uh, this kind of, uh, I wouldn't call it belief, a makeup, I would call it a makeup uh, constitution because uh, there are people that may not agree with what you have said, but there are people that it's their kind of life, their whole life. But you approach a, 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 an intersection, an inter intersection that causes you to deviate from what you really believe and what you would like to pursue in your life. Now, at that point of intersection that you are kind of not really going that way you would have wanted to go because of um, inadequacies here and there. So what would, you, what would you do? What would you do to bring yourself back to focus? Because um, I personally am an immigrant. I've been here like for seven years. And I came in the, at the peak of the recession. So I have not handled any corporate job in the US because I couldn't get one. I went and did my master's thinking it would open the door for me. It did not. So I'm here now because I'm on the way of opening my own business. But in totality of uh, this message, I agree with it in totally but um, I have to leave. When you have a belief and the situations are not what they should be, it causes you to kind of move away from where you should be. So how does one, like in this society, I'm using this society specifically because I, I would say I didn't have that much challenge before I, I came to the U.S. How will I be able to have this focus, exactly what you have said? I agree in totality with what you presented. I was late, but when I went through the, uh, uh, the body of your presentation, everything you said is correct to my okay. own belief. So let me ask, answer your question. Um, I'm not sure I have a, a good answer, but I just thoughts, okay? And, and, I, and I appreciate appreciate your your bearing your soul here a little bit. And you know, you you've had a, a rough you know go, right? And and yet you got your master's degree, right? And so you've you've done a lot of great things. One thing is be careful about looking around you and seeing what others have and comparing yourself to them, okay? That's, that can be dangerous because in this life, we're all not very smart, you know? We're really not. I wrote a book on the, the post-mortal spirit world, what happens when we die, and there's millions of people that have come back and said, oh my gosh, you won't believe it. The learning capacity on the other side is a hundred times what it is here, right? It's just, it's like you can see things in 180 degrees and it's instant. One guy said he used to struggle in math in high school. You know, in five minutes, it's like it all became clear, right? And then he came back from his near-death experience and was like, whoa, you can't imagine what it is like on the other side, okay? So I just illustrate that to say none of us are really that smart, okay? And it doesn't matter where you are on this spectrum, okay? It doesn't matter. 
You know, you just start from where you are. Okay? And if you're, if because of the, the circumstances that you were brought up with, you know, you didn't have the situation I had, okay? I mean, you, you might be starting, Lord, but you have, you've been on this trajectory. And that's great. It's line upon line. You just work the next step. You know, try and use all of the, the things for learning that you can and keep working on it. And it, it's, you're going to be fine. Anyway, I don't know if that's a good answer or not. But any other questions? Yes. Um, if, if this intelligent learner, this is typical, then underneath is lousy. Yeah. Lousy you know, I think. the passage of time a lot more. I, I, that's a good question. You know, where does, does time go faster for the diligent learner or average learner? Anybody opinion on that? I mean, based on this graph, I guess it's very Well, I don't. I never even thought about that when I did the graph, <laughs> to be honest. Like I said, some of you can probably do better graphs than I can do, take into the passage of time. but. Yeah, I think the diligent learner, I don't know who, who time, who, what time. I mean, the diligent learner, time goes by fast because they're so enraptured with the learning, right? They can't believe they didn't have time to get through it all, right? It went like that. But on the other one hand, the typical learner who's coasting, I mean, those ball games go by real quick, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so I don't know. But, but when you figure out a better graph, let me know. No, it's, no, I, I, think, I think we have heard that intelligent people are ahead of their time, meaning that the time is not moving as fast yeah. on them that it does for lousy learners. Yeah. If, if you read a lot of books, you, you are going vertically. So yeah. really, time has a small effect on you. Yeah. Interesting, effect. interesting question. Good question. I haven't really That's thought right. about it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I don't know if this would fit with that or not, but one of the things I've been pondering uh, lately is as how we are as old as we perceive ourselves to be. Uh huh. Right? And you have people that are that are in in earthly years quite old, and they act very young. Correct. And they see themselves as young, and then of course we see the vice versa. Right. right. But I think it has something to do with that, perhaps. Is that when when you when you are constantly learning, there is a refreshment of that, which causes you to stay very young. And if you're inquisitive, it goes back to being a young child, and that can mm -hmm. keep you young, regardless of early time. Very good point. So maybe that's something to do with that. Good. Yeah. Thank good you. point. Thank you. Okay. Let's let's get somebody else. Sorry. Go ahead, Tom. Okay. I notice on your sources of knowledge. Uh huh. The link between my acquaintances and the people I interact with has been a good source of knowledge. Oh, that's a good one. How did I leave that off? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. In fact, they can be your best what? sources of knowledge, right? Oh, boy. Big, big huge mess there. Yeah. I mean, having a mentor that you can go to, extremely valuable. Oh, good, good, good point. Great. Others? I, I wanted to make a comment on what you said about uh, uh, living ahead of their time. I, I don't think it has to do with the movement of time. Mm -hmm. My belief about that saying, I don't think it has to do with movement of time. Uh, instead, it has to do with all of us are presented with the same thing. But someone that has the knowledge runs faster with it. That's my own understanding. It's not the passage of time. It is the uh, ability, the mental. The mental, yeah. yes. Time is not as critical as what you're saying. You, is it, shouldn't be? Is that kind of. Um, not really? Yeah, not, not really. It's, it's just like now, you just deliver this. Running with it, someone can allow things to fall by the wayside, but someone focuses and moves on with it and gets to a logical conclusion. Right. Okay, we got time for yeah. one more question. Actually, not that one. Remind me of a saying, I forget who said it, maybe it was Gandhi. He said, uh, learn and seek knowledge as when you live forever, mm -hmm. but act as though you're going to die tomorrow. You know, yeah, I've heard so that. Yeah, 
Oh, that's great. I like that. Did you everybody hear that? Learn, learn as if you're going to live forever, but act as if you're going to die tomorrow. Okay. Please fill out the evaluations. They're useful to us. Thank you. And we'll see you next year. Our next, our next uh, seminar won't be until January. So thanks for coming. Appreciate it.